Well, thank you guys for the invitation and for um, you know coming to hear what I have to say about about underwater robots. Whether you're here for for just the lunch or to hear me speak, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, so, and thank you, Ken, for that really kind introduction. Um, so, my name is David Lang. I'm one of the co-founders of a project called OpenROV. We make these open source, low cost underwater robots. I have actually one of them back here that I brought along to show. Um, and, you know, like Ken started, this project uh, has really kind of spiraled out of control from a treasure hunt that my friend Eric Stackpole and I wanted to go on. Uh, it was about three years ago. Um, I also want to talk today about some things that I've been thinking a lot about over the past few months. And it's, it's really a result of having kind of grown this community of, of DIY ocean explorers and started to hear these stories of why other people wanted to explore. And a lot of people have been trying to put us in this box of citizen scientists. And I'm not sure if any of you uh, have heard the term of citizen science before. It's quite a popular uh, phrase to be thrown around, but nobody really knows what the definition is or, or, or what it means. Um, there, are, there are groups like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that have really done some pioneering work in getting amateurs to contribute data to larger studies. And that's kind of what the extent of the, of the definition of citizen science is, getting amateurs to participate in the process of science. But I think there's actually something much more interesting and something much bigger that's happening around this whole kind of concept of amateurs um, you know, taking part in the process of discovery. And so I want to talk a lot about that today. And, and to start that off, I want to tell you about a conference I went to two weeks ago in London called the Citizen Cyber Science Summit. And this was a, a conference of all the leaders of this so-called citizen science movement. You know, it was people from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It was groups from Zooniverse. Zooniverse is a website that puts up, you know, photos from the Hubble and allows anyone to identify galaxies or, or other anomalies online. It's a lot of really interesting click work. Um, and, I, you know, I sat through this whole conference listening to all of these people tell these wonderful stories about how amateurs were actually participating and getting cited on papers and all these things. But something was kind of eating at me um, from you know, from the, in the audience. Something was in my stomach I, that I had to get out, and, and I brought it up during my talk. Um, it's because I, I was really coming from the maker perspective. And, you know, Ken mentioned the, the maker movement. That's something we, you know, feel that we're definitely a part of. You know, we started this thing by showing up at Maker Faire and, and asking people for design help. And so I, I took my time at this conference, and I, and I really wanted to emphasize who these makers were and what they were doing. So I started this talk with this, with this slide. And I asked the crowd how many people have heard of the app WhatsApp. And this was right a few days after it had sold to Facebook for $16 billion or $14 billion or whatever, whatever amount that was. And only about half of the crowd had ever heard of WhatsApp. And I said, okay, so even though not everybody here is using this app, they just sold to Facebook for $16 billion. To put that in perspective, the NSF's annual budget is about $7 billion. NASA's space exploration budget is $3.6 billion, and NOAA's ocean exploration budget is about $20 million. And the reason I started with these slides is because I wanted to put everything in context, everything that was happening in that room, in that auditorium, into some context. And you know, you know, it was great to talk about the data that these amateurs are collecting. It was great to talk about the papers that they were finally getting um, cited for and recognized for. It was great to talk about the associations and, and moving this forward. But I think it's also important to talk about these larger trends. That you know, it's not it, not everything we're doing is about getting cited on paper, on papers and and conferences. It's about just technology. You know, technology is driving all of these new opportunities and new ways for people to connect. And I think the same is true for discovery. So our story. So. Um, Ken gave me a lot of credit, but it's really, it's really I've been a, a part of something, a, a, a small part of something. Uh, the, the real genius, I, I think, is my friend Eric Stackpole. And I met Eric three years ago, and within 10 minutes of meeting him, he started telling me this story about this underwater cave in Northern California with gold, and there was, uh, no one had been to the bottom, and all these cave divers had tried, and no one's made it. And he was really animated, and I was totally, you know, it, I was enthralled 
by his story. It sounded like so much fun. And then he told me that he wanted to build this underwater robot to go explore this underwater cave. And this was an early prototype he had made. And, and at this point, I was totally hooked. And I didn't have a job at the time. I had just been laid off from a, a startup that I was working for that ran out of money. And so I was like, I'm in. I want to help. I want to do whatever I can to, to make this thing a reality. And so what we did was we created a website called OpenROV. And uh, this is where we started sharing our early designs. Uh, we made the whole project open source, meaning we really asked people for help. You know, how can, you know, what ideas should we improve? What, what can we do better? All these different things. And we started getting feedback. At first it was slow, um, but we just stayed with it and kept doing it and kept improving that finally attracted more and more people. And then we went back to the cave. And that was a really fun experience. It was a group of us friends, and we had built this robot that worked enough uh, to get to the bottom of the cave. And that story by who knows how, but got picked up by the New York Times. And the New York Times wrote a little story about our underwater robot and what we were trying to do. And all of a sudden, we got overwhelmed with demand. And so we put a project up on Kickstarter, and we raised $100,000. We raised $20,000 in the first two hours. I mean, I, I distinctly remember clicking that button and just watching the numbers go up, and just we were all high-fiving and really excited. And then it kept going up, and then we just kind of were like, oh, man, we really, we really have to do this now. Um, so it was really exciting and then totally terrifying. And this is actually the part where Colin comes into the picture because Eric had to go to, An to Antarctica to, for some work that he was doing. And I had to sit there and, and try and build all of these underwater robots. And this is what we did. We sold it as a kit, um, but it was still quite a, quite a challenge to put it all together. And all these boxes started showing up in the garage. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves as kind of these micro manufacturers. And thank God Colin showed up. Colin showed up uh, a few months into that and, and was, was ready to help and really kind of made the project what it is. Um, but we finished it. You know, we'll, I keep pointing out Colin, but he was a big help in actually getting this stuff done. Um, and now these, these underwater robots are going all over the world. This is a photo from a cenote in, southern, or in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. ROVs made it down to Antarctica. And this is a, an old map of where all these contributors are in, in the world for the project. And, and we have a similar map of where all the ROVs, there's now close to 1,000 of these ROVs out there. And, and the map is, is similarly distributed. I snapped this photo um, in, in an airport when we were on our way down to Long Beach for an event called the, the Ocean Exploration 2020 Summit. And this was a, a, a photo of Colin and Eric in the airport and three ROVs that were all part of their carry-on luggage. And I thought this was kind of an interesting picture because here it was two guys, three ROVs, and it was all carry-on luggage. And I sh we showed this slide at that, at that summit, at, the, um, at the, the Ocean Exploration Summit, and it was pe people from Woods Hole, people from Scripps, people from Mimbari. And this was kind of a revelatory photo because this was something totally different. I mean, these, these folks were accustomed to really big budgets, really, really high-end equipment, you know, sh really expensive ship time. And this kind of idea uh, was very new to them. And I, we quickly explained that it wasn't just us, you know, that we weren't the only, the only ones doing this. There was, there was a whole maker movement. There were people who were taking these low-cost parts and, the, and these digital fabrication tools and prototyping all sorts of stuff. There, we, there's a Raspberry Pi that someone wanted to take across an ocean. There's people making buoys. There are people making low-cost CTD devices. Um, all sorts of just ocean equipment were being prototyped by these makers at really low cost. This is an example of the open CTD device um, that, that had popped up after, after our project. So we, we kind of went through a list of these, and everyone was kind of like, wow, this is really actually something interesting because it was so different from what, what they had traditionally done. And so this is kind of this theory that, that I've been working on in developing this idea of citizen exploration. And it's not the same as, as citizen science. It's not about just getting people to go out and identify data. This is about communities of amateurs. This is about people who are just interested in things, going out and building the tools that they need to answer their own questions. And so I have this photo of John Dobson, um, who was the creator of the Dobsonian Telescope. <coughs> And he actually just passed away uh, a month ago, and he was, he was, I don't know, 98 years old, and just had, had a, a huge, huge life. He was uh, a Venetian monk for many years, 
and then became infatuated with the night sky and started building his own telescopes with whatever he could find. And he figured out this really low-cost way to build this telescope out of any, just about anything. Um, and that's why they call it the Dobsonian Telescope. But he also started this group called the Sidewalk Astronomers. And he would stand outside in San Francisco on the street corners and just invite anyone to come and look at the sky. And there are now sidewalk astronomy groups all over the, all over the country, all over the world. There are um, amateur astronomy groups everywhere. It's a very, very popular pursuit. And it really started because of this low-cost tool and these different communities of collaborators. So that's what I've kind of been basing this theory uh, on, this idea of citizen exploration, is low-cost tools and communities of people who are interested, amateurs in particular. Uh, this is a photo of Chris Anderson. This, um, he used to be the editor-in-chief of Wired. Um, but this photo was taken at his house in Berkeley with his son, where they had just tried to take their Lego Mindstorms and build an autopilot for this plane that they had, um, that they had also, I don't know where they got it, but they tried to build their own um, autopilot. And you know, the plane crashed, uh, but it actually it set him on this path of thinking, oh, wow, you know, these tools are becoming so cheap that maybe we can actually make an autopilot for one of those things. He started a site called DIY Drones, just, just like OpenROV. In fact, we modeled a lot of what we were doing after what Chris had done and started sharing his design and getting other people involved. Um, since then, he's left his job at Wired and is now has a drone factory down in Mexico and is manufacturing um, these low-cost drones. And I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone now. I mean, everyone is familiar with these, this idea of low-cost flying smartphones is basically what they are. I mean, this is, you know, five years later, this is a common everyday thing and we're seeing videos from, from these drones all the time. We're seeing all sorts of uses from wildlife conservation to um, journalism, to you know, all sorts of uses for this this type of technology was started. Really, it was really the fire was really lit by this group of enthusiasts, by this group of amateurs. Uh, this is a, a photo of the actual same garage that OpenROV started in, the one I shown I had shown with the boxes. This is the same garage. This is a, a group of of guys who um, were in the garage before us, and they had an idea that they could build low cost. Satellites. They wanted to build these, basically take a, uh, an Android phone and turn it into a satellite and take new um, take photos. So instead of having really expensive um, satellites that, that only take a few photos of the Earth, they wanted to build lots of these satellites. Um, and they've done it. I mean, they've since launched, I think, 30 satellites. I think they're going to have um, 100 by the end of the year. But uh, there was just a big article about these guys in... Um, the New York Times on Monday, and they're getting daily images down to 10 feet, I think is the thing, or 10 meters maybe. No, it's 10 feet um, to, of, of resolution and daily updates. So we're going to be able to view the planet um, every day, which is a, a, this is an amazing, amazing feat. Not only have they built these, these um, phone sets for, for very, very cheap, but the data actually significantly changes so many different things. I mean, we barely scratched the surface of what this stuff is going to be used for. They started out of the same garage that we did. I mean, this is a really, really extraordinary time that we're, that we're living in, is where you can, you know, with a group of friends, start prototyping an idea, get it to market, and then, you know, they've since raised $50 million and now have this this growing company. They're running a space program um, from their offices in San Francisco. I, th I think that's totally amazing. And so, to me, that is what's happening. You know, this is, this is much bigger than this idea that we have of citizen science where there's just going to be people who are, you know, watching birds with their apps and counting things. You know, this is actually an explosion of curiosity and that technology is enabling people to ask really interesting questions but to not just stop there, to be able to go out and build the tools that they need to answer those questions, and then to share what they've built, to share that data with others. It's moving really, really, really quickly. And so that's why I think that citizen science is getting so much more interesting, is because that, that circle for curiosity is getting a lot more interesting. And you know, Eric said to me, I don't know when he said it, six months, Colin, you may have even been there, but he said, 
you know, David, I think that the maker movement and the science community are on kind of a collision course. And I kind of sat there and said, okay, that's interesting. And I think he's right. The, you know, I've had a lot of time to think about this, and I think, you know, this, this is happening. I think it's an important discussion. It's an important conversation that's not being had, that's not being talked about. Um, because we have a lot to learn. You know, we, we have people who want to do all sorts of weird things, um, and it's, it's really, we could use a lot of advice. We could use a lot of guidance from engineers, from scientists, about what we should do. Because just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Um, and so I think there, there needs to be this dialogue. Unfortunately, I don't think it's happening. I hope it does, because I think it holds this potential um, to, be, to be something really wonderful. You know, I think that there's the, the capacity to have even more discovery. I think there's the capacity to engage the, the public and, and amateurs in the process of discovery. And I think that if we don't have the conversation, that it actually could get ugly. I mean, we've already seen this. We've seen kind of rogue biz businessmen turn into rogue geoengineers dumping iron into the ocean in, off the coast of Canada. That's crazy. And, you know, it's, it, if we don't start having a dialogue and, and start thinking about these things in a way that brings amateurs to the table, I think it could go bad. So I'm, this is why I'm talking about it now, is because I want, I want this discussion to be, to be wider. And... Um, I also want people to know about the opportunity. So that's I, really all the answers I have. So I think we're at the very beginning of this. And if you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Right, thank, thank you. Yeah. Can I have a mic? If you guys have any please. You know what I always forget? <laughs> to really explain what OpenROV is does and is like the actual and this is so embarrassing I do this almost every time so what it is is it's it's um, it's got a camera right here and it drives around it's got thrusters in the back and on the top and it drives around and it sends live video through this very thin two wire tether twisted pair um, back to your computer and you're able to view it um, from there so that's that's what it is I'm sorry that that's came at after the presentation What's the, max length of the, tether? The, the tether's length is 100 meters and, and that's been the depth limit so far. Yeah. Okay. On the same topic of the tether, um, yeah. I could imagine the tether being rather fragile, uh -huh. but then making it robust is going to drive the price up. Right. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've discovered in... Uh, about that trade-off? Yeah, so that's a good question that applies to not just the tether, but almost every single aspect of this ROV. Is why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? And what we've... There, there's, there's always two answers. One is we're, we're fighting this really interesting battle where we want as high a performance as we can get at the lowest possible cost. And it's not just the lowest possible material, but the 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 way that we can manufacture something like this and, and actually put it into a, a number of different robots. So that's, that's a tension that we always face. With the tether specifically, it's, not, we've, it's been broken like because it got stuck in the props, but we figured out a way to, to avoid that. But it's never been like a tugging thing where it's, it's actually broken. So it's actually pretty robust. And the other thing is some things we just ha actually haven't even thought about. So that's why we have the website and we encourage everyone to provide feedback because some things are really just simple, straightforward ideas that we just hadn't even thought about yet. So I think it's a good question. What happened to the Indian gold? <laughs> That's another thing I always forget to talk about. Um, you know, we didn't find any, any treasure in the, in the bottom of the cave, but we always like to say that we found this bigger treasure, which was this community of collaborators and people who are participating in the project. So you talked about the collision between the maker movement and the science community. Right. One thing the maker movement is really good about is communicating information to beginners in a very bite-sized, step-by-step way. Right. So could you talk about the experience of taking the role as a teacher when you wrote your book? Right, right. Yeah, you know, I think that, um, I think it was Kurt Vonnegut who had this wonderful um, 
quote about revolutions. And he said you, in, when, in one of his books, and he was like, you need three types of people. You need someone who is a true genius, who really understands something differently. You need an upstanding member of the community. And then you need, the third thing is you need someone who can explain anything to anyone. And I think the, the interesting thing about the maker movement right now is they have that. They have all of these people who are geniuses, who are really just playing with these new tools and new toys and coming up with really interesting things. And then you have the, the engineering community who said, yeah, you know, I think the maker movement is wonderful. This is a really great thing that's happening. And then you have people who, like me who are just getting into it who are busy trying to explain everything to anyone else. And I think for citizen science, for this citizen exploration, whatever we want to call this, this collision, for this to work, I think what we need are all three of those things. We need people who are building low-cost tools and really have interesting ideas about how to, to make new things. We need the science uh, community to accept it and to say, you know, this is a re these are really good ideas, interesting paths worth pursuing. And then we need people who are just getting into it, who are very comfortable explaining it to everyone else. So I think that's a, I think that's a really important part. And I think it goes beyond just teaching. It really, it really goes into all sorts of sharing. You know, the, the maker ethos is, is it, it doesn't matter if you make it. It matters if you make it and that you, and that you share it. And I think that the, there's a lot to learn as far as, um, you know, how makers are able to kind of share information in general. Um, yes. <clears throat> On sharing information, okay, in science, science shares it through a big set of peer-reviewed journals and whatever. Yeah. Um, and so that's not appropriate, but uh, is there some type of tools uh, that you see uh, might be built or, or you know, people who are building in order to share the, the results of a lot of people having these tools so they don't just end up being isolated, uh, collecting information on their own without getting out to everybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a few things. So kind of, I'm going to break down my answer to that. And one is that yeah, science has this whole peer review process and that's worked for you know, centuries. But even that is starting to get disrupted in, in terms of these open access papers and a lot of the work that Michael Eisen, Jonathan Eisen, and all those people are doing. So even that is starting to change because I don't have access to those, that, that information. You know, I, I mean, me down in my little lab in Berkeley, I can't read all of these academic papers. Um, so, the, and then the, the other one is you know, where the people collecting this data. And, and we're building a site we, which we're calling Open Explorer for the people in our community to share those stories. But there are all sorts of places where this is starting to pop up. I mean, there's, there's Project NOAA or iNaturalist and all these different apps that are starting to, to come around to try and capture this data. Um, I think it's okay if it's really disparate right now. I think it's okay if it's kind of this Cambrian explosion of different ideas and strategies because then some of them will fail, but we'll also see what works. And um, it's so early right now that it's, it, you know, this is something I noticed at the at the Citizen Cyber Science Summit is that it, these the people there really wanted to create a structure and fit all of this stuff into a box. And I think that's a really f quick way to kill it, to kill the enthusiasm and to make it not fun. And so what I I've been saying is like, just go for it, just just. You know, if you have a question, go for it. Just build the tools, share what you're doing, and so we can all learn from it. And I and I'm really excited about the the wildness of it all. It's kind of feral, it's kind of weird, and it's kind of fun. Uh, what was the hardest part about making your robot cheap, and how did you do that? Um. So the hardest part is not just making a cheap robot. The hardest part is making a cheap robot that you can make 100 cheap robots or 200 cheap robots. The real challenge, the real interesting challenges um, come in when you start having to do these things at, at, at larger scales. Manufacturing is really hard. There's a reason that there's, there's factories and experienced people um, who do this. And, and a lot of makers are, are figuring that out and finding that out. Is it's, it's one thing to make 10, 20 of something. It's quite, it's quite another to make 10,000 of something. Um, and so that, that's where a lot of the unexpected challenges have come. Um, but I think for just making this thing low cost, it's, it's, it's just been a mad, matter of, of time, really. You know, we, we, you go out, you test it, you see what's wrong, and you fix it. I mean, when Colin showed up, there was, there was a lot of things we, that needed to be better. And what we did was we just picked them off one by one. We started figuring out, okay, that needs to be improved, that needs to be improved, that needs to be improved. And these new digital fabrication tools, the beauty of it, is you don't have to commit to 
runs of 10,000 of something right away. You can just do small batches and you can iterate quickly. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of specific technical things that we were able to overcome and a lot, um, in particular, like the, the home plug adapters that we use are just off the shelf. You can get them off Amazon and, and we're really a breakthrough in communication. Um, but the whole method and model, and if you come by our, our little lab and everybody's welcome to stop by in Berkeley, um, we're having a build day on, on March 29th on Saturday if you guys want to come and check out this whole, how this whole thing works. Uh, has been setting up the operation there to churn so many of these things out. So I hope that makes a good. Uh, I'm really curious about this open robot and uh, some basic questions like how deep this robot can go and uh, it can only go on the bottom of the ocean, I guess, and then only crawl, not swim in the water column. And uh, can this robot record videos? And if it does, what's the quality? What's the size? Like how many megabytes? Like gigabytes to yeah, yeah. size? Yeah. Um, so. I'll try, I'll try and break those down into several questions. So the, the depth is 100 meters. And so how this thing flies is it's got two thrusters in the back and then one on the top. So basically, this is how you go up and down. It, it could fly. It's neutrally buoyant. So you can drive um, and fly it that way. Uh, there is a um, camera on board. Uh, current, and you, you just pull up a browser and you're, and you're in. And right now, the, the camera quality... We, you know, sometimes we, it's 1080, but you, sometimes we knock it down to 720 just to get um, faster, faster frames, more frames. Um, honestly, most of the time we just attach a GoPro on top just to record the video that way, or you can use VLC on your on your computer to record it. Um, but I think we're we're getting better where the the, the webcam on board the, the computer or on board the ROV is is getting pretty good, and and I think that um, it'll get better. And some people have um, been adapting the ROV to use higher quality cameras. And I think we'll see more of that um, more of that in the future because it's, it's one of those things where every part of this you can upgrade to use whatever you want. And we're just using kind of standard um, USB webcams for a camera, for, again, for this kind of idea of low cost, having a lot of them. Um, but you can, you can up the camera quality. Um, so you mentioned how this whole maker movement is kind of like this Cambrian explosion of like ideas and you know sure. uh, prototypes and stuff. And I was wondering what you think is like kind of the driving force behind that. Why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen previously? Kind of what was stopping it and what's driving it now? Yeah. So um, well, there's a lot of things that have come together. A lot of stars that have aligned to allow this maker movement to occur. And it's really young. The first Maker Fair was less than 10 years ago. And I think Dale was really, Dale Doherty, the founder of Make, was really kind of a genius for saying, for calling people makers, because it was a lot less threatening than engineers. Like if I tell someone I'm a maker, someone says, oh, I'm a maker too. I make dinner and I grow food. And it's like easy for people to get into it. Um, some of the technical things that have changed um, are, are, you know, smartphones. I mean, we, we kind of underestimate how recent this is, but we're, we, I guarantee you, and I guarantee, but I, I bet everyone in this room has a computer in their pocket. That's crazy. And the, the, the economies of scale of, those, of that happening has made all of the sensors so much cheaper, has made um, you know, these, these, um, the computing so much cheaper and smaller. And the other thing is the sharing. So... Like Arduino, for example, it's it, all of a sudden they built like this building block for a microcontroller where you don't have to. If you want to design something, you would never go and design your own microcontroller. You just use an Arduino, or Raspberry Pi, like a minute, like a miniature Linux computer, or you know all these other designs. We started building the scaffolding using open source kind of hardware ideas that you don't have to recreate the wheel anymore. And and coupled with that, people started building these these digital fabrication tools like 3D printing. And for some reason, those just became really, really interesting headlines for uh, the media to write about. And all of that stuff together has just... And, and coupled with all of the, the cultural and societal stuff, like I think, you know, there's no more shop classes in high schools. There's so many people who were like me who were just kind of feeling like all they could do was sit in front of a computer. I think there was this kind of cultural human need and desire to make stuff. To like, 
and, and I found that even you know, over the past few years is there's an incredible amount of satisfaction to finishing something and to building something that you had a hand in, in creating. And, and um, I think people are sick of buying stuff. Uh, just buying like more stuff. I think that the idea of participating in the process of creation is is really important. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of running on of all these different factors, but I think they're all of them. And then the other big one is Kickstarter. I really think that changed a lot of things um, because it all of a sudden, you know, we at least I grew up in this world where everything was done for me. I mean, all, constantly we're just bombarded with advertisements that only show like these finished products that that you can consume. And I think Kickstarter kind of kicked the door open to that whole process of, of how things come into the world. And um, I, think, I think the Kickstarter is the tip of the iceberg as far as people wanting to participate in the making of their things, the making of their culture, the making of, of the society, I hope. Um, and so to me, it's, it's more than just the tools. It's more of this kind of cultural need to um, to be a part of something. I think that's a really human thing. I have a couple of questions. Um, you, you know, you mentioned uh, you know creating this open source community. Can you talk a little bit about sort of you know how you engage with that community and how that's sort of provided that feedback for you? Um, you know, maybe some of the most interesting things you've heard from them. And then the second part being, so what do you envision the future of Open ROV being? Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And, and, yeah. You know, I, this is a good question. I get this question a lot. Is how did you guys do this? How did you guys build a community? Because so many people start projects and they say, hey, it's open source, and nobody shows up. Um, and I think what we did was we just didn't stop. And, it, it, you know, we never told people how this was supposed to be done. If you... I think Eric is a really bright guy, but he's also one of the kindest people I've ever met. And he's really exciting and, and enthusiastic. And he's really fun to be around. And, and I don't know. I mean, Colin will attest to this. I'm like completely worthless. So I'm always asking people for help. And, and, and I think we just created this culture where we were very welcoming, that we really were interested to hear what everyone had to say because we wanted to know. And, and I think that... You, the important thing for us to be at the beginning was just sticking to it and and continuing to be welcoming. Anytime anyone had any questions, we were there. I mean, we still are, but like anytime anyone had any questions, we were very eager to to get them involved and to figure out what they wanted to do. Um, and so it's not a, it was never been really about us. I mean, of course there was the cave and the stuff, but it's always been about meeting these other like-minded souls. And I think for the future of Open ROV it's very much the same as now we've kind of found these like-minded people, these people who are interested in, yeah, we should have low-cost tools that we can go and explore the ocean. There's, we've kind of found these kindred spirits who share our, our ethos for adventure and exploration and, and really opening those doors up. And so, I, so, like I said, one of the things we're doing is building this site called Open Explorer, which we want to be um, kind of a continuation of that. So shifting the focus away from just what we're building, which is still very, very important, but also to what we're exploring. Because these stories are amazing. I get the wildest emails from people every week from something that they want to go explore, some shipwreck or some, some species or some tr something. Like, it's mind-blowing. And I think once we start highlighting some more of those stories, then more, more people are going to get um, excited about what's possible as far as um, you know, going out into the natural world with our, our technology. Yeah, um, actually, this, this is a really nice um, basis for my question. You talk a lot about like-minded souls and sort of providing tools to people who are curious and people who want to explore and citizen explorers. And I'm curious about whether or not you have observed how the effect of these kinds of open technologies on people who are not curious, at least not yet, in terms of an outreach perspective. Um, we talk a lot, especially I think at Berkeley, about the STEM pipeline um, and engaging people, especially younger people. Um, and I just wanted to know if you had seen firsthand the effects of the maker movement and these open technologies on people who are not previously curious about these topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I've absolutely seen firsthand. I mean, definitely. Um, and, you know, for, for young people, I mean, that is instantaneous. I mean, if you... Come to Maker Faire this year, 
and come by our booth and watch these kids play with these underwater robots. I, I, I had a kid show up at our office with his dad on Saturday and just ran, had randomly stopped by our office and he'd seen Eric driving an ROV in Lake Merritt the week before and he, Eric had given him an ROV red beanie and he came in and he was, he was nine years old and he was just lit up, like so excited about this stuff. I mean, just randomly popped in our office. And um, I showed him around, showed him how everything was, what worked and was made. And he was, as he was leaving, he said, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to build robots when I get older. And I was like, yes, it's awesome. And, and I think, you know, it, it, the, the, those stories are, we've got, there's a lot of them. I mean, if you go to Maker Faire, you see the look on these kids' faces. And it's very, very clear that this should be, this should be done. I think it's more than kids, too. Uh, I know for me, there's just... You know, a couple of years ago, I just knew I wanted to do this. I wanted to make something. I'd been to Maker Faire. I had seen it, and I was older, and I wanted to get involved with it. And I think there's a really big level of fear that people carry about failing and about not being good at something, and just kind of, just kind of closing those doors because they don't think they can. And um, I wrote this book, Zero to Maker, exactly for that reason: is to show people that, yeah, you, you, you mean even if you don't have these skills, there's there's a role for you uh, in this world. And um, a bunch of people have read it. I've gotten a lot of notes from people who, who have. And I think that we have more work to do there. More, the on-ramp could be better. It could be easier. It could be more welcoming. Um, you know, Dale uses this example a lot of marathons. I mean, it's crazy to run a marathon. But so more people now than ever are running marathons because there's these like easy there's there's running groups and there's you know you go online and you figure out okay here's like the the 12 week training thing that I need to do to run a marathon I'll do this the first day and so I think we need to build better on ramps um, and then the last thing I'll say about this is the the exploration thing is is a little bit different than the making thing because I think humans are creative they want to make but I also think humans are explorers and I think that we haven't really articulated that our culture hasn't done a good job of articulating this in a long time. I think National Geographic, you know, has traditionally kind of held that position in culture, but it's always been about like these explorers with gray beards and old men who, old men with gray beards who go places and do things. And it's not been about you and your 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 ability to go into even your backyard and find wonderful, amazing things to to be curious about. So I think this idea of exploration. Is, is ripe to be to be reimagined in this world where technology is so empowering. Um, so I think we got even more work to do there. Hello. Um, maybe I'll, my question is, is strange, but I came here for my interest in the technical solutions. Like, but I've all I've heard, most of what I've heard for you is that you are part of a bigger movement, which uh -huh. is this open openness and sharing and so yeah. thank you for all your comments but I, w I was wondering if I have an interest like a related to what you're doing yeah but my interest is private uh, from a private company sure how can I tap into this source uh, and it's probably not so complicated or complex to get it to academia or to do it here at Berkeley or whatever yeah so how can I connect with this community of makers and try to develop a solution together is that possible or is it or, or is it about all about sharing and you know? You just, you just want to make money. That's what you're thinking. Or you, well, what is your what are well, your goals? Well, I come from Chile, and when I make money, there's yeah. work for people. Yeah. Which would, that don't have any access to the things you're talking now. Right. And nothing of what's going on here goes on down there. Yeah. So it's money for some, no, for many maybe. Yeah. You know, and and it's a service. It's like when you buy an iPhone. I mean, mm -hmm. someone is making money somewhere. Sure. Right. So so I'm asking is. Is it possible to to tap into this community, or or is it just for discovering and which is? Uh, I mean, oh, sure. I'm all for that. I'm all for that. I'm just yeah, asking yeah, yeah, the totally. question. You know, that's a good question. Um, we're not losing money, first of all. We're not losing money. Well, you know, we have a company. We have we're gonna have ten people there this summer, um, and people are making money. I mean the. MakerBot, the 3D printing company, just sold, you know, started open source doing all these things. They sold their company for $600 million a couple, six months ago. It's not too bad. Who did they sell to? Uh, Stratasys. 
which is a bigger 3D printing company. Um, you know, the, 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 this is another big story, is that a lot of these makers have found themselves as manufacturers, as companies, and are growing in, in, that, in that regard. And I think that that's definitely a big part of this, is that all of a sudden it's kind of maturing, it's kind of growing up. And there's, there's some people who are more purist who just want it to be everything open and, and, and free and have it just be about the spirit. And I, and I think that's important that, that, that it's about that. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's okay that, that people make money. Um, and people are making money, but if you want to, if you want to just have like a private, like if you want to sell an iPhone, for instance, then then you just have a product, and then you're competing against Apple, and then you, frankly, that's really hard to do. I, I think that the, that model is still totally doable. I mean, people do this all the time. I mean, it's very, e it's not very easy, but you you can have a product idea and and find a factory and raise a bunch of capital and, and still do the traditional things. What this is, the maker round, is it's another way. And it's a way that those big guys can't compete because they're not going to share their designs. I mean, they're not built to kind of incorporate kind of these large distributed networks of, of creators and almost prosumers. So it's almost like the David and Goliath thing where y there's no way that, that they can compete against that because we're, we're not just selling a product, we're selling a process. And so it's a different way of thinking about it. And um, I don't know if we're, I don't know if this will be the, if we'll be the, this will be a huge money maker for us, but, I, but it's a lot of fun and it's, it's very fulfilling to do it that way. And um, if it works out, I think that's great. Um, if not, I think there's there's lots of ways to do it. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you for your talk. I was trying to resolve the the idea there. We have citizen explorers, but there's a lot of engineering involved in this. And I wonder if you've sold these devices to people who really they're not really that interested in the engineering. They're interested in the exploring, mm -hmm. and and you might end up with some sort of issue about supporting people who really are kind of in over their heads oh, with the technology. Me. Yeah. And just wondering like how you've resolved like do you have a whole support system for doing that? And then the second question. So I answer that, and the second question, if there's time, is um, so is there a lot of shared code between OpenROV and ArduPilot? I mean the, the two. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I'm going to answer the second one first because it's really quick. None, because we have totally different technical challenges. Because underwater, there's you know there's all sorts of different communication strategies, and we had to make an actual device. So kind of ArduPilot kind of just put um, you know kind of computation processing on top of like an RC community that already existed. We kind of had to build our own device, which was a different kind of challenge. Um, the other one, the next question, is really interesting because. Yeah, so far, we've ha attracted these people who are like in this weird Venn diagram of makers and engineers and people who like tinkering and they also like ocean, so they're maybe scuba divers or something like that, but they also get the kind of open source thing. So there's this weird little circle in the middle and that's the people we've attracted so far. And um, how do we get beyond that? And this is something, you know, our mission is not just to build... Um, the lowest cost underwater robot. That's part of it. But our goal, we really want everyone to realize how amazing this planet is and to go out and explore the world. I mean, that's really why we started this is because we wanted to do that. And so part of that is figuring out how are we going to get people who want to want to explore and aren't necessarily as proficient um, with the technology. And I think, you know, what you've seen with all of those, those groups is that the technology's just gotten better and better and better and easier and easier to use. And that when we're finding the same thing. Is that it's every iteration that we have is just is a lot easier to use, and we keep attracting um, more and different diverse groups of people. And I think right now our, our strategy is to stay on that path and keep getting this into the hands of more people and keep getting more people excited about about what we're doing. And yeah, it's turning into a serious support issue, and that's something we're learning as a, as a company. And we're learning as, as a community because a lot of these questions are popping up on the forums. So we have, you know, it's kind of like this intellectual pyramid scheme where the people who've learned the pro solve the problems help the other people. And um, that's worked so far enough. But you can see, I mean, I can see that as, as that circle grows that we're going to have to do more and more of that. And I think that's just a matter of, of growing up a little bit and, and figuring out what, what system we actually need to build and what that's going to cost and all these things. And, and doing it. 
But so that's a really important and interesting question that we're still trying to figure out. Thank you. It was a fantastic talk. Thank you guys. So much.